Hi everybody, welcome to this webinar in which we will talk about automation of uh, telecommunications platforms and in particular those legacy telecommunication platforms. So again, hi everyone, hi uh, Sławek, hi Tomasz. So what's the plan for today? Um, after shortly introducing ourselves, we will uh, briefly describe what uh, Cisco Broadworks is and uh, the platform which we are going to automate in this webinar. Uh, we'll discuss briefly the tools that we used, uh, what was difficult in this in this uh, in this undertaking, and uh, then last but not least, we will show you a complete demo of automated deployment of a Cisco Broadworks voice platform. So who are we? Uh, I will start by introducing myself. My name is David Mielnik. I am the delivery director of the Telco Service Unit here at Software Mind. Uh, we carry out projects related to collaboration, call control, observability, and uh, automation of uh, core network telco platforms. And my name is Sławek Bednaczek. I'm a principal system engineer uh, in SoftMind, and I'm uh, also a team leader. Uh, my team is uh, involved in Broadsoft uh, projects. My name is Tomasz Czwapski, and I'm a systems architect with a telco background. Uh, and also, I'm leading a DevOps guild in our company uh, where we are trying to develop and promote uh, the DevOps culture, expand people's awareness uh, of the need for continuous software uh, improvement, as well as knowledge about cloud native and uh, automated automation technologies. What we'll show you in this webinar is, a, is an extract of a much wider project in which of course, there are cloud native applications, there are uh, Kubernetes, but uh, uh, like we said, we want to focus on uh, legacy telco platforms. And this is what we'll, we are going to discuss, what we're going to show you. And then in the end, we are going to demonstrate uh, uh, the deployment of uh, automated, uh, automated deployment of uh, Cisco Broadworks platform. Soft is a communication software platform. Uh, that uh, is de delivered by Cisco. Uh, it's in general, it's embedded in service provider network and provides you various services for uh, unified communication uh, communicators, uh, for uh, mobile users, for SIP uh, SIP trunks, for uh, SIP terminals, uh, and those combined users with a mash of services that also Broadsoft provide you uh, provides you. Um, you may build, uh, you know, um, from big scale businesses to small businesses, um, you know, full, fully, uh, uh, full mesh of services that simply uh, drives your business. And in general, this may be, you know, the services from Broadsoft are offered to the uh, customers, right? And, you know, sometimes even mm -hmm. if you call some uh, call center, an example, you may not even be aware that you use uh, Broadsoft because you just call uh, in transparent, let's say, way uh, and you, you reach some uh, call center from, I don't know, bank or uh, any other enterprise and you, you don't know that uh, you've been served by Broadsoft right now. So let's talk about, uh, let's say, Broadsoft components that we uh, will use today during our demo. So we have the application server. It's a, let's say, main server with logic inside, with subscribers inside. It has a um, timestamp database installed in the memory uh, that is efficient for real-time applications uh, and for users uh, here. Moreover, um, uh, database can be replicated so we can build a cluster to uh, provide some uh, high availability and so today on uh, doing our demo we'll build application server as a cluster setup we have also a media server mainly is rtp streams so whenever you have any comp uh, conferences uh, you know bridge calls uh, whenever you have any announcement heard from broadsoft uh, media server is involved um, network server uh, is something additional uh, it simply supports application server and other elements of Broadsoft uh, components uh, to uh, serve traffic. And Network Function Manager um, is something that is not in strictly involved or directly involved during the, uh, the call service. 
but it uh, supports operational team uh, simply to uh, monitor uh, broad soft network components. And in our case, uh, we'll use MFM as a license broker because uh, you must know that um, Broadsoft is a licensed software and before you proceed with uh, Broadsoft configuration, uh, you need to provide license. And for this purpose, we use a network function manager as a license broker. So we have, a, let's say, set of licenses installed on MFM and we uh, use a API uh, simply to uh, install, uh, install license on the servers that uh, we'll have in, in this demo. So guys, tell us a little bit more about uh, infrastructure as a code tools and uh, the ones that we have used and, and why. Okay, uh, regarding the um, infrastructure as a co uh, code tools uh, available on the market, we have uh, several right now projects and uh, we, we may simply divide them into uh, say tools that operate um, based on the domain, right? So we, we can have uh, management infra infrastructure uh, tools uh, and some um, configuration management tools. Uh, as you can see uh, on this chart, we have uh, several uh, tools that can even overlap domains, right? So uh, some some of uh, tools may operate on uh, management infrastructure and, and management uh, and con application management configuration as well and but there are also some brother some other tools that are focused mainly on the single domain uh, in example terraform uh, operates rather on uh, as a management infrastructure tool uh, while uh, in example puppet of chef uh, can you know you may achieve some uh, infrastructure management and uh, infra infrastructure uh, configuration moreover you can also uh, say apply this one to uh, uh, to application configuration domain as well. So Swabek, uh, there is an apparent question uh, why we have chosen Ansible and Terraform and not only Ansible if we see that it also covers the infrastructure management uh, area. In general, uh, Terraform is very useful uh, for uh, management infrastructure uh, and I will tell you a little bit more uh, about the Terraform and uh, probably you may uh, let's say guess why I, I let's say I choose uh, Terraform to build our uh, infrastructure. Let's say from our perspective, uh, Terraform is uh, easier to be used. Uh, okay. It's more let's say much flexible for infrastructure provisioning. So let's use a tool that's uh, let's say uh, is more aligned to our requirements and needs rather than uh, putting putting uh, everything on Ansible side. I think Terraform is also the most popular now tool uh, nowadays uh, for uh, provisioning the infrastructures. So yeah, the, the choice yeah, is the popu popularity. It might be also a point, right? But uh, hopefully that on the next few slides uh, <coughs> we'll we'll uh, we'll go a little bit deeper into uh, Terraform and Ansible, and we may simply discuss it why we decided to have it that way. Sure. Okay. Okay, so um, regarding Terraforms, uh, so extra words about Terraform. So, um, uh, as I mentioned before, it's rather provisioning infrastructure um, tool, and um, it, it has a, a HCL files uh, that are, let's say, written in human readable form, where you may simply define some uh, on-premise or uh, cloud resources. And moreover, it has a um, declarative approach. What it means, uh, what is behind that. Um, in general, uh, you put, you define some infrastructure, so you describe just some infrastructure inside, and it's up to Terraform to deliver uh, this uh, infrastructure uh, for you. So we don't care about the order. We simply define some, um, define some files where we describe our infrastructure, even if it's somehow uh, combined a little bit, in an example uh, like Kubernetes cluster and so on. So this is a very, let's say, big advantage from uh, our perspective. Moreover, uh, Terraform uh, uh, detects the state, so it uh, 
uh, it recognizes uh, what element were created and it simply detects the state of this uh, element later on. And uh, another, uh, let's say, big advantage from my point of view is uh, that Terraform is provide diagnostics. So um, we are not, let's say, glued to some single uh, solution and, you know, uh, this gives us uh, this gives us some flexibility uh, during the project process, right? Okay, so let's talk about about Ansible a little bit. So it's rather a configuration management tool, and Ansible is uh, used mainly for um, application installation and application management. Moreover, uh, it might be used also for your operating system uh, preparation because it may simply change uh, single files, single lines in the file and so on. So it tracks also those and decided that you that you have uh, you know, proper configuration inside. Moreover, uh, it's rather procedural approach than declarative. And what it means that the order of our um, tasks uh, in the playbook um, is important. So we can, I can see already that uh, there are some benefits of, of, of why we have chosen Ansible for someone that knows uh, how uh, the installation of uh, Broadworks is arranged and uh, having in mind that uh, the operating system have to be prepared in a special way according to the prerequisites and, uh, and uh, installation uh, would require a more procedural approach. But uh, the obvious question is, uh, why we have chosen Ansible and, for example, not other, uh, not other application and configuration management tools like Chef, for example. Um, my my response is quickly agentless. Um, uh, in general, Ansible, from my point uh, point of view, requires only SSH connectivity. While with other tools, we have to also install some uh, agents, so uh, it brings some additional efforts. Uh, on the environment uh, that uh, that is let's say provisioned, and uh, that's why we used uh, Ansible. From, from my point of view, uh, agentless is a, a big advantage for that. Yeah, I think this is also uh, the adventure is also the simplicity of uh, its configuration files. Yeah, we use we use uh, YAML language, or YAML YAML syntax in uh, Ansible playbooks, which which is well known. Oh, I think worldwide in IT uh, world. So this is the, also the, the advantage. Uh, so we have already touched uh, a little bit about uh, the challenges of uh, installing Cisco Broadworks, the prerequisites, interactive approach, not declarative configuration. So uh, let's go into the details. What, what did we have to face and how did we overcome it? Okay, we had, uh, let's say, uh, challenges or steps that we had to address. Um, so, first of all, we had to choose some infrastructure provisioning. So, uh, regarding, uh, we need to choose our uh, infrastructure provider and the tool uh, that we that uh, we use for <coughs> uh, provisioning management, right? Uh, Second is uh, that uh, Broadsoft requires some additional um, preparation of the Linux system. So we need to uh, be very strict in scope of providing um, Linux machine uh, and it should be configured according to, to uh, Broad Cisco Broad Broadworks uh, requirements. Moreover, we have to also install uh, third party installations. Uh, so what it means is that to, we are, we should uh, pr provide some additional software uh, because without uh, broad, broad soft application won't be installed uh, correctly. Next challenge we had is uh, providing broad soft uh, software uh, itself, um, perform the installation. Uh, then um, broad soft has also uh, post install tasks. So before we start an application, before we license the application, um, we need to perform some uh, additional steps. Uh, so after uh, of uh, after both of installation, um, extra task has to be done, right? So extra task has to be performed before uh, before server is uh, let's say operational and ready for um, for configuration. So this this task has to be also addressed for us. 
And then next challenge is to uh, proper license delivery. Uh, as I mentioned to you before, uh, we have NFM, so we need to somehow uh, combine uh, NFM to provide uh, licenses in automatic manner for us. And the last but not least, probably a uh, browser of configuration. Um, Browsoft uh, do not support, uh, doesn't, uh, Browsoft simply uh, doesn't support uh, country, flat config files, right? Uh, it uses a BWCLI interface. So you may simply say, say that it's a kind of a shell where you uh, configure Browsoft being in front of the keyboard, right? And perform all tasks that uh, are required to uh, to configure Bosoft for you. And what is important here is that uh, we decided in that case that so if we are not able to provide you plat config, right, like in an example for Apache, we may simply provide some template with the config and uh, Apache will, or Nginx will uh, is configured properly for you and, uh, uh, and that's what you want to. Uh, here uh, we need to provide, uh, let's say, figure out some different solution. Um, so uh, I will tell you a little bit how we address it uh, on next slide. So how we change the addresses. So um, as you can see on infrastructure provisioning, we decided to have uh, Proxmox and uh, Terraform. Um, so uh, for Linux uh, system preparation uh, and the third party software installation and so on, we use Ansible. Not the fact that, as I said, that uh, it's very handy for uh, configuring operating system uh, in scope of very single and very detailed way. Also uh, for Broadsoft installation uh, and uh, post-install task, we also uh, use uh, Ansible here with some, some tricky part. Um, for license delivery, uh, NFM has a uh, REST API uh, that uh, can be used. So we also, let's say, um, put uh, some parts of code uh, that uh, simply address these issues and it's uh, triggered by Ansible, uh, this communication, and in, at the end we should get uh, uh, software licensed properly. And process of configuration. Uh, this is also part that uh, has to be, uh, let's say, a little bit, uh, I'd like to say a few more comments. So, uh, Browsoft, uh, Browsoft applications uh, do not have uh, flat config files. I mean, it have, uh, they, they have, let's say, uh, they have some part, um, but in general, uh, from our perspective, to con properly configure Botsoft, you need to, you have to use uh, BWCLI interface. Uh, you may say that is kind of shell, and uh, being front of of the shell, you may simply uh, you know configure all uh, all required changes that you want to have, and uh, and to, to configure properly uh, Brosoft uh, applications. Um, so uh, if you are not able to provide the flat files, we decided to use expect, right? Uh, expect script. Uh, and this expect script can be treated as a config file. So uh, you might template it, uh, you might, you know, uh, change the, in, let's say, perform uh, all required changes that you want to achieve, right? And then this expect script is delivered to the, to the server and executed. And at the end, we should get the correct uh, correct uh, configuration inside the Broadsoft application. So it's a trick to overcome CLI-based uh, configuration with an expect script to kind of give you a file-based uh, approach to, to configuring where actually in the fire there are yeah. commands that are then executed through the CLI. I'm not sure if 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 everyone is uh, let's say um, if everyone know uh, what 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 uh, expect is right. So maybe we could say a few words about uh, expect itself. Um, so uh, in general, expect is a, is a tool simply that allows us to detect what is uh, let's say output right, and uh, depending on the output, uh, we can. Uh, we can define some input uh, data uh, and uh, execute them. So uh, whenever we want to, let's say, uh, uh, 
um, put some uh, put some script that uh, simply let's say uh, doing a tricks like we would be in front of the uh, shell or uh, in front of our let's say uh, computer. Uh, you know, we, we may simply uh, put it in the uh, expect script and uh, uh, execute it later on. So it's the next automation tool we used in our project here. Yeah, exactly. So it's, it's, instead of being in, say, in front of the keyboard, you must simply put it in the <laughs> in the script and do it do it by yourself, right? Okay. So I think it's a time for uh, architecture part. So, um, in general, approach that we'd like to achieve is that you have an operator with a CI CD tool. And based on this tool, uh, Ansible or Terraform is uh, triggered uh, with proper uh, playbook and proper um, template inside. And at the end, we should achieve, uh, oper uh, let's say, Cisco Broads of uh, operation in, in uh, operational style, state. Uh, additionally, we may also, uh, as you can see here, that we have also um, Elasticsearch uh, to, uh, you know, the purpose of having Elastic with uh, Cisco Brosov is uh, uh, observability, observability. So um, today we mainly focus on the central part of uh, our uh, diagram. So will uh, show you how you might simply uh, uh, achieve the, the goal with Ansible and Terraform to build a Cisco Broadsoft uh, platform uh, and uh, ready for uh, handling traffic. So in a typical project, uh, the goal that we want to achieve is to have uh, the deployment of uh, Broadworks uh, handled in the same way as the rest of the code and the rest of the application. So triggered from the CICD, and then handled by observability tools, but uh, uh, for the purpose of this demo, we will uh, deploy the platform and trigger Ansible scripts by by hand, basically. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So um, a little bit more about the architecture here. Uh, so uh, as you can see on the top of the screen, we have a uh, uh, two application server, Broadworks AS1 and Broadworks AS2. Um, they are combined. Uh, they let's say that glued together as a cluster. Uh, in the center of, of our um, diagram, we have also uh, Broadworks uh, Network Server 1 and 2. And those two tools, uh, those two uh, servers are also uh, clustered. Um, because uh, let's say we may also bring some uh, high availability in scope of uh, network server, so let's do it. That way, and uh, uh, on the bottom we have a media server. For our demo, uh, one media server is enough, so let's build uh, the only one. And on the left side, you can see NFM. Um, today uh, we uh, will not be uh, deliver. We, we won't deliver NFM uh, because we have already installed NFM. And why do we do that? In general, uh, NFM uh, is a licensed broker, as I as I mentioned before. So after um, NFM installation, you have to provide a fingerprint to Cisco, and based on this fingerprint, a license uh, is uh, generated for you. And before you proceed with other tasks, uh, you have to have this license already installed on NFM. Because without that, you won't be able to, you know, even to start lots of applications. So that's what we decided for for for, the, for today's de demo uh, to have already NFM provided with license installed, and uh, the the next uh, step is to provide rest of infrastructure we want to have in our setup. Okay, guys. So I think uh, um, we can also discuss some sequence flow, uh, how we want to achieve it, uh, before we make any code review. So uh, first of all, we have a uh, uh, Ansible. As I mentioned before, uh, perhaps I haven't. Uh, in general, um, Ansible and Terraform can be uh, combined together, and depending on your needs, you may even uh, trigger uh, Ansible from Terraform or uh, doing, uh, let's say, vice versa. I mean, the Ansible may trigger uh, Terraform to build in some infrastructure for us. 
Um, today we decided to have a Ansible and Ansible will trigger Terraform, right? And Terraform will build uh, infrastructure on Proxmox uh, and at the end we should get uh, Linux servers uh, ready for uh, communication for us. Uh, then, as I mentioned, uh, we have to uh, configure and prepare uh, Linux servers accordingly to uh, broad soft requirements. So, um, Ansible is used to uh, is used to configure um, operating system uh, properly for us. Uh, so you can see it in the center of the screen. And then we will also trigger Ansible to deliver um, binaries and config files and patches uh, to uh, to the let's say targeted servers uh, perform installation and when installation is ready and post task is uh, is done we may provide um, license so uh, uh, we will again use ansible and uh, rest uh, api uh, to communicate with the, uh, our nfm node and NFM will license our uh, newly installed uh, servers. When uh, when servers are licensed, we may perform uh, uh, configuration. So uh, again, we will uh, involve our Ansible to provide expect scripts and execute them uh, on our behalf. So uh, at the end of this process, we should get a um, uh, Broadsoft installation completed and all, let's say, servers should be in, in operational state and ready to handle calls. Slavik, how do you execute uh, each next step? Do you have some kind of triggers here in your Ansible playbooks or is, is it one playbook? Which... It's built in the, we'll see in the code review, but it, it's built in general in, in the single playbook but a single playbook contains roles right so um depending on depending on the step you i'd like to achieve right i'm simply executing role that was uh, built uh, you know to uh, um, let's say to to address some specific parts of uh, configuration steps uh, moreover uh, we also use attacks because you know um using roles uh, also may let's say uh, contains a lot of uh, additional functionalities. For our demo, we don't need to do it all the stuff or preparation like, like we do on, uh, in example, on production sites. So um, we'll limit uh, some parts of our, uh, um, of our roles to single tags, uh, just to make sure that uh, it contains, uh, let's say, basic configuration required for, uh, for our demo. And was it difficult to deploy, uh, for example, the application servers in the cluster mode uh, for you? As we know, for people familiar with uh, Broadworks, these require some steps first to be uh, done on the uh, first node and the second node. And yeah, in general, it off. in general, in general you, you, it, let's say, let's say it depends. Alan. If you know a little bit uh, Broadsoft, right? If you are familiar with Broadsoft and you, let's say, get used to installations and so on, you, you know what is inside. Mm -hmm. um, then you need to simply, let's say, uh, think about how you would perform in Ansible way, right? So um, there's are some tricky parts. In example, that depending on the Broadsoft release. Uh, some files are in different places, so you need to be aware of that and uh, put some statements that simply address it properly. Uh, depending on the broad of release, you also may have some, uh, let's say, different behavior. In example, uh, after uh, broad of uh, uh, binary is uh, installed, right, and again, depending on the release that you are installing, you may have a uh, spontaneous reboot, server reboot or not, right? Because in, mm -hmm. uh, at the end, uh, some uh, in, uh, uh, binary installation, it uh, requires some uh, server reboot and it performs for you. Uh, and an example, uh, Ansible uh, doesn't like it, right? It, uh, you need to, uh, you know, uh, handle this, uh, in, let's say in some order that uh, it's not a failure, we know about it, Please proceed with the uh, rest of the steps, right? So, um, if you if you let's say are familiar with uh, Ansible, with uh, Ansible, and you are familiar with 
uh, with Glossoft. Uh, it's rather, let's say, uh, some way uh, that you may simply address it properly. And because you, uh, uh, you know that it's not error, something that, uh, that, uh, that simply occurs, right? Um, especially, for example, post install tasks, because depending on the release and depending on the type of server, a post install uh, task script might be in different places, for example. So you need to detect it, detect it properly and execute proper, uh, proper script. So it's not just uh, simple application deployment, but rather a complicated platform, uh, which uh, is uh, which you need uh, a deep knowledge of it. Yeah, you, you yeah. Engineer. Yeah, that, yeah. In general, you should be uh, familiar with some gears that are inside the Glossop. Yeah. So knowledge of the tools and experience with the with the platform and. Uh, uh, these problems can be overcome. That's correct. So, we have talked about some difficulties that we might have uh, when deploying uh, this uh, Cisco Broadworks platform. We know that there is uh, prerequisites to be addressed on the OS level before we can proceed with the installation. We know there is a you know, there are some difficult parts which, ha which have to be addressed by Ansible, like uh, like uh, interactive and uh, post install uh, uh, behaviors and scripts. Uh, we know there's some um, not very friendly for automation CLI. There's uh, licensing involved as well. Uh, so show us Swavik how how you have uh, how you have overcome all these uh, all these uh, points and. Uh, show us show us uh, the demo so what can we expect at the end of the demo okay so i suppose that uh, first of all we would make some short code review right to to you know to uh, to our to get our um, to get everyone familiar uh, familiar with uh, uh, what we what we did and how we did it and then we can simply execute uh, the the playbook and see how the installation goes okay I understand that we'll place a live call at the end to see uh, that uh, everything yeah, I hope surely so. is up and running. Keep keep finger crossed that yeah. In general, after after this uh, execution uh, of of, uh, of the Ansible playbook, we should uh, get the uh, platform fully operational and ready for to handle calls and you know to 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 create users and so on. Exciting. Let's go. Okay, so let's do that. All right, guys. So let's go. Through our code that we built for to uh, for our setup. So first of all, as I said, we can ask uh, Terraform uh, to be to to be triggered, uh, let's say by Ansible, and this is a part. So we have already Terraform um, template, and those are uh, simply executed uh, by Ansible. So instead of doing um, you know. Um, Terraform apply, right? We have this part of code, and uh, at the end we should have uh, our um, our infrastructure delivered. Uh, later I can show you in general before we uh, start uh, broad uh, broad of installation. I can show you more or less how it looks like if we uh, let's say if you would do it from Terraform perspective. Uh, so I can apply some telephone plan, and you will see that how many um, how many servers will be built, and to, um, and what the details more or less uh, will be introduced by the uh, telephone. Then we give some uh, we give some time simply to spin up all servers, um, and uh, later on we what we do is start we are starting configuring. Um, CentOS operating system uh, to uh, bring us brings our uh, Linux up and ready and ready for a browser installation. But before we we do that, let's go uh, to Terraform. So we have TF files here defined. As you can see here, we are using Proxmox provider. Um, as a uh, as a provider of uh, our solution. Uh, then we need to also define some servers. Uh, as an example, I'd like to show you how application server looks like. So we have, you know, some uh, 
target node uh, in our cluster. We have some um, uh, disk requirements, uh, network, or even we have some uh, cloud in script that is executed later on. Mm, that's why we are also giving some additional time. Uh, and moreover, uh, we we have also uh, we have all, uh, we have also some API uh, already assigned for the network for the uh, server. So at the end, we should get uh, Linux uh, Linux machine ready to be uh, ready for communication with our control node. Um, it's a pack. Uh, then we have also, as you can see, packet bin. But I will be uh, I will be discussing this later on. Why we have this packet bit here? Uh, let's uh, let's focus on the broad soft install. So uh, as I, as I said before, configurations and uh, we need to perform some configuration of the Linux. So uh, we use the role uh, that simply brings us uh, some uh, configuration uh, steps for uh, Linux. Uh, in example, let me let me at the at the beginning we are providing some proxy information for uh, YAM to be updated. Then we are checking if we have all packages installed uh, that uh, simply both of requires. Uh, then we also design SI Linux because this is one of the recommended uh, parts of for our setup uh, in the series. We also introduce some NTP. Uh, we also make some uh, DNS setup. Uh, what we also do is that we need to prepare uh, etc host, all our allow, uh, deny, and the uh, host itself. We are using templates for that. And also, what is important at the end, we are also uh, introducing locals depending on the host name that we execute this uh, playbook, right? So uh depending on the host we need to add log host information because this is uh, this is what uh, broad of requires as well um as you can see also we use tags so depending on the tags right we introduce some specific part of our configuration um we are we for our setup we will not be executing executing all tasks here uh, because uh, we don't need to, right? Uh, so uh, whenever we be, uh, let's say, whenever we will be executing uh, our uh, our playbook, I will add all required uh, tags that should be executed. You will see later on why we need that. Uh, so let's go back to our installation webinar here, mm, playbook. So as I said, we are introducing some centers with the role. Then we have a role that simply um, build for us application server. Let's take a small review. Uh, I will not be showing you each server because the idea more or less is the same. So we have a, we need to create a directory for installation. Then we uh, copy uh, we, are co we copy binaries and patches uh, that are required for initial uh, installation. Next topic is that we also uh, deliver installation config file. Uh, so uh, you may install it. Uh, you may install Broadsoft uh, in uh, in active mode or deliver already a pre-configured file that contains uh, some configuration and you simply execute it with the config file or uh, application with the patches. So as you can see later on, we start, we are installing application server binary with uh, initial patch, uh, patch and uh, in installation conf file, uh, depending on our server, okay? More or less the same we do for for rest of the servers, depending if we have the um, if we if if you use the some uh, it is uh, release based or it's in the independent release, right? Or with independent release, we don't use initial patch uh, patch uh, packages. This is uh, specific, yeah. Yeah, exactly. This is also specific. Uh, 
Next topic is uh, we need to prepare post install post install task. So uh, whenever you install Broadsoft uh, later on as a, a BW a admin uh, user, uh, you need to perform post install. Uh, what we do here is that instead of doing it, uh, so log to the each server, perform this post install task, and, and so on, we simply ask uh, Ansible to do it for us. Uh, depending uh, depending on uh, on the uh, let's say server and uh, release, uh, we need to simply change one of param param parameter from uh, false to be true, so we can perform our auto post uh, post install task on our behalf uh, later on. Uh, as you can see, we have uh, introduced a role BWKS post install. So let's see what we have here. So um, depending on the uh, on the our release, we need to replace a flag from false to true. Um, then what we need to do is uh, we are checking because it's also uh, depending on browse of release. Uh, where this post install setup uh, file uh, is located. So uh, in uh, release 22, 23, or 20, 24, you may find this uh, this this file in a few different places. So we uh, also have to let's say address this uh, this one and replace it in the proper uh, place. Okay, so that's why you have uh, when statement here. And as you can see, we tag it as a post install task. Then what we need to do, uh, we are installing media server. Media server is more or less the same uh, way, you know, let's say the, the same idea as we had uh, for application server. The only difference is that uh, I created a different role for the for for this uh, for this type of server. Uh, an example, if if we if we let's say start thinking that we need to also add something for media server, we can introduce it directly to the role. Um, what is next that uh, I would like to mention it here? Uh, okay, post install task execution. So uh, whenever you have cluster, you need to also take aware about uh, order. Uh, where you perform this post install task. So uh, let's say the general idea is that you need to perform post install task um, on the primary first, then on secondary. So uh, this is why we also use uh, here a uh, order of execution from uh, from as a different task. So at the beginning we are performing post install task on the primary one. Then we perform post install task on secondary server. So if we fail for some reason with the primary, we will not do it on the on the secondary. So all these tasks needs to be done in sequence. Yeah, and uh, you have to uh, explicitly take care of it in the in the in the Ansible uh, scripts. Yes. Uh, also, and what I see, uh, what do I see, uh, that to achieve our uh, our uh, automate automated uh, installed uh, platform, uh, we we need to uh, have a deep knowledge of automated automation uh, tools. But uh, not not only, we also need uh, a deep knowledge of uh, broadsoft. And maybe uh, this is the most uh, important. Yeah, you need to you need to know Brosoft. Let's say what is inside, uh, what gears are inside, and how they are, let's say, launched uh, quite deeply, right? To to understand why uh, behavior. Uh, as a good example, because you you Thomas mentioned this one, uh, you can also see here that I have a statement here: ignore unreachable yes. Why? Because uh, depending on the release, uh, suddenly. Uh, your uh, after installation process, your server may be rebooted. So uh, if you are aware of it and uh, you know that it may happen and it happens, right? Because uh, simply at the end uh, it uh, reboot is required and uh, both applications simply uh, perform this reboot. Um, Ansible would stop 
right? Because uh, something, wow, why I lost my connectivity to the server, right? So that's why I put it here, you know, unreachable, yes. So only if we reach unreachable statement. So if we, if you face any other error, uh, but let's say playbook will stop and will simply return an error that this, uh, we, we could not perform some steps. But if we reach unreachable state, uh, it will go on, right? So uh, this is what you mentioned already that uh, yes, yeah, some uh, the big deal is not let's say prepare, uh, the biggest deal is not to prepare a playbook. It's rather uh, to understand how Brosoft installation uh, behaves and how it proceed, proceeds. So how to use different tricks, how to bend the, the tools, uh, knowing how the platform underneath behaves in order to achieve this uh, full installation, taking that's into correct. account all those, all those different yeah, that's correct. tips and tricks. Um, okay, so let's, let's go to the, some post install tasks. Um, so I already introduced your, the role. So this is how we uh, execute post install. As I said, primary first, secondary later. And the NFM. So what we, how we do it? Uh, we simply use a CRL tool. Uh, let me let me show you some. Uh, so we have uh, we have some uh, XML associated. Um, then what we do is uh, we are trying to use a CRL command, right? And we use a, a network function manager API. Uh, to uh, to simply uh, trigger an FM and perform for us some uh, some binding, and also uh, we are asking with the API uh, to uh, perform a license of the service. Okay, uh, I know probably Tomek will ask for that. Why we don't use a, a URL? Uh, URL uh, module of Ansible. Uh, I decided to use URL because uh, it was more handy for me in general, right? Because we have we use here a body, uh, and in general, you know, uh, I would need to struggle more, let's say, uh, more on Ansible, while we simply can use a, a URL with handy uh, in handy way. So I decided to use URL here. Okay, guys, so then after license is being uh, assigned, so as you can see here, uh, we have a loop uh, and perform a, perform a, a license assignment. Let's go up. Uh, so when we have a license already in place, we can start our browser of application. Okay. Uh, as you can see, I'm using simply shell module to start Broadsoft. Uh, what is important here that instead of uh, root user or something like that, um, uh, I'm, I, I simply do it as a Bworks user, okay? Uh, later on, when you have uh, all applications started, we can start configure, it, uh, configure those nodes. So as you can see here, uh, this part is configure NS node and this part is configure application server node. So what we do simply we provide a role uh, PWKS configure. So let's go there. Let's check it. Okay, guys. So this is how we do it in, in general. We uh, uh, we simply uh, uh, checking if you have a export uh, expect uh, directory, right? This is how I decided. Then I deliver uh, with a template uh, um, expect script. So at the end we should get uh, some uh, some expect script in place uh, in the. the the directory that uh, that we created here. Then we are executing expect with the with the uh, with the with the shell command. 
uh, this expert sheet uh, after uh, execution uh, and success and successfully execution uh, we are stopping and starting bubbles why because in mainly in the initial configuration you need to do a lot of uh, conf config changes that requires both of restart so uh, I'm doing that way so uh, I'm not using here uh, any handlers uh, because I would need to define services uh, and uh, it was uh, it was quite handy to to perform the start and stop with the false command. Okay, guys. So in general, this is that's it. What I want to to, to show you here, mm, we can check it uh, how it works uh, in our uh, live de demo. I'm eager to see it in action. Yeah, let's let's, let's go. go. Okay, guys, so we are ready to proceed with uh, execu executing our um, playbook. Uh, as you can see, uh, we are using the install webinar YAML file that was discussed in previous section uh, with uh, following tags, uh, basic, uh, broadwork install, post install, license, um, lic uh, broadwork config, and also Terraform. Simply, um, this, those tags limit uh, our actions that are required for our setup. Let's proceed, let's try to execute it. As you can see, the first task is the Terraform. So mainly we are, provision, uh, we are provisioning uh, our infrastructure first. Uh, it may take uh, up to five minutes even, so uh, let's uh, fast forward this section and we will, we will slow down only on um, moments when any comments is required so let's proceed and please stay with us okay so after five minutes as you can see our um, infrastructure has been provisioned um, right now we are gi giving some extra time simply uh, to those uh, servers to spin up and, uh, and then we will start uh, Linux configuration and Broadworks uh, and Brownbrook installation. So um, let's move to the next section just after that. We are starting right now uh, Linux configuration. As you can see, packages are being checked if are uh, installed or not. And after this section, uh, our Linux operating system should be ready for Broadsoft software installation. As you can see here, uh, our application servers are installed. Also, we uh, hit an uh, unreachable issue that I mentioned before. Uh, mainly, we need to expect such behavior, so we need to address it. Uh, we simply wait until application servers are booted again. And uh, after that, we may proceed with post-install tasks. Right now, we are starting post-install tasks on the first server. And uh, after first one after primary server is done we proceed with secondary server so let's fast forward this uh, section as well okay so as you can see both uh, application servers uh, are done also um, post install tasks are done on those servers uh, we've started with media server installation process um, in general uh, it will look very similar to application server as well so we will have a, a binary installation and then we, we, will, proce we will proceed with uh, post install task uh, very similar also we'll have on network servers so um, let's uh, jump into a license delivery section okay so all servers are installed with post installs tasks um, so right now we are triggering an nfm node to bind nodes and also provide license. As you can see, uh, it's been done already. So right now we are starting with uh, Broadsoft application. Um, application uh, on each server is started. And after that, we will uh, proceed with the Broadsoft configuration section. It looks that uh, we've done all tasks as you can see in summary, we hit uh, three unreachable states here. Uh, as I mentioned, it is expected. It seems that uh, application, uh, process application 
um, has been uh, configured with success. Application uh, has been started as well. So next step is to check the cluster status. Um, and if everything is fine, then we may proceed with the enterprise creation with uh, a group creation and, the, uh, and add some users and make a test call. Okay, so uh, as playbook is done, I'd like to check right now uh, how application server cluster looks like, what's the stage there. So uh, let me log in first. Okay, let me check if uh, all required processes are running. Okay, it looks fine. We have all, uh, all processes up. So let's proceed with a uh, uh, health uh, check. So I'm uh, I'm checking uh, it with health mom command. It may take some time. And we'll check if any alarms are present on the platform. Okay, we have no alarms present. That's good. So right now I'm checking uh, cluster status. As you can see, uh, application server one is a primary one, it's uh, in unlocked state, and uh, application server two is also in unlocked, so it means that the second one is secondary node. So let me check the timestamp uh, replication status now. Okay. It looks fine, so we may simply proceed with uh, um, enterprise group and user uh, creation and uh, then hopefully we will make a test call. Okay, so let's open a uh, compiler now. If my config is in place, um, I should have my account created, so let's try to log in with this account. Okay, it, uh, ask, uh, it is uh, asking me to change my password, so it's, uh, it's normal behavior, so let's update the password. And then we may proceed with uh, enterprise group and uh, user creation, so let's proceed with that first. Okay, my account is updated, so let's proceed with the rest. Okay, guys, so I updated my password and I created also enterprise uh, group and users that we will use during our call. So let me show you. As you can see, I prepared two users. One is 48 uh, from 1 to 9 and second one is 48 from 9 to 1. So let me show you right now uh, how uh, the user looks like. As you can see, it has line port assigned. Also, it has authentication because we will register our user through application server. So we have to this we have to have this uh, authentication service enabled and also um, created credentials for that user. Let me show you assigned services. So we have some basic services, authentication, external and internal uh, call line ID delivery. So that's all. That's what we what is required to proceed our test call. Okay, guys. So uh, what we did was uh, mm, we built uh, our uh, cluster. We built. Uh, fully operational broadsoft and as i showed you uh, it seems that uh, it's ready to handle calls moreover um, i was able to create an enterprise groups and add users i uh, already passed my some credentials to Tomasz. so first step is let's try us to uh, register so i'm going to register now 
Yeah, I'm logged in as you can see here. Tomas, how's your site then? I'm logged in and waiting for your call. Okay, so Thomas and I uh, have registered successfully. So right now I'm going to make a call to Tomas. Okay, it's calling. Okay, Tomas, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Oh, there was some voice. <laughs> okay, so it worked. Great, thank you. Okay, so um, so let's try to um, uh, to make a call to some uh, unknown or not existing number, uh, so we could see if you have a. Media server triggered, and we should uh, had some announcement that uh, call cannot be completed. So let's try this one. Your call cannot be completed as dialed. Please check the number and try your call again. Thank you. Okay, so it looks that media server is being triggered, and it plays on um, uh, the announcement that the uh, call is not uh, being uh, is not being completed right now. All right, guys. So um, in general, you may notice that I also installed uh, some packet bit uh, for our uh, in our setup. And why I did it? Uh, in general, uh, I have uh, prepared some Elasticsearch, um, and uh, just uh, those two, uh, let's say, dashboards are simply show to to show us how to show you uh, that you can easily combine uh, with some bits uh, that are created by Elastic. <clears throat> and you may, uh, let's say, bring some uh, observab observability to uh, our setup. Here, as you can see, uh, I trace some invites, right? Uh, SIP invites, uh, here are SIP messages. Uh, this one were achieved by simply um, installing packet bit on our application server. And the <clears throat> stats are uh, collected by Elasticsearch now. On the bottom, uh, you may see uh, heap usage right now. What we have here on the server, <coughs> mainly uh, this one uh, achieved by um, by uh, Logstash uh, with uh, SNMP agent installed uh, plugin. Um, this is like let's say kind of heads up for you guys that perhaps in the next webinar we may show you. Uh, how you might introduce Elasticsearch for your uh, Broadsoft uh, platform. So this was also uh, deployed uh, automatically uh, via Ansible, correct? Yes. I mean, <clears throat> uh, if you noticed uh, on in our let's say playbook, uh, we had a part where a packet bit was installed on the application server. Okay, so. Not only can we uh, automatically deploy a uh, traditional legacy telco platform, we can also use modern tools uh, for observability like Elasticsearch to interface with the SNMP and to uh, bring, uh, take out and bring into the dashbo uh, dashboards some interesting uh, information from, from within the platform. Right. Yeah, but it's an SNP is just uh, just a part. Uh, with Packetbit, we are simply uh, taking, uh, let's say, network traffic and uh, visual visualize it uh, here, right? So uh, we can recognize that this is a SIP message, and uh, here we uh, we can inside check what is inside the packet and recognize that it's an invite, you know, the method inside the SIP. So on the top we have a <clears throat> Packetbit, let's say uh, output, let's say uh, output. We have a uh, output from uh, data that are collected by Packetbit to Elasticsearch. On the bottom, uh, we have a uh, we have a output uh, that is delivered to uh, to Logstash, and uh, Logstash has uh, additionally installed um, uh, a SNMP agent uh, plugin that allows us simply to query uh, our bots of setup and get some additional information. You should mention that Packetbit. Is supporting now uh, natively, uh, natively uh, uh, SIP traffic. So this is it's eerie. This is really easy to integrate uh, yeah. <coughs> telecommunication platforms 
into uh, elastic search. To be field. honest, I to be honest, I didn't have to even check too much regarding the uh, what's inside. Just you know, um, taking uh, discovery from the index, we uh, we started collecting. Uh, we started collecting, and you know, it was easy to to figure out how to build such uh, such dashboard for us. Excellent. But what is uh, quite insightful and important to me is that you can have a, a legacy platform and automate it, and you can have a legacy interface and also use it to, 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 to achieve observability. That's correct. Thank you for uh, joining this webinar. I hope that uh, the tricks, the challenges, the tools uh, that we have uh, showed you can also be of use in, in your own projects. Thank you, guys. Thank you and see you next time.